So far, we have looked at Ace Aval, Aim Aval joint test and evaluation exercises, reviewed the exercise environment, mission details, and lessons learned regarding the then new all aspect infrared Sidewinder missile. Now we'll see more details on the use of electro optical systems and hear what Navy pilots and their backseaters or radar intercept officers had to say about the exercises and what came after. I think what people have to recognize is that we are in a very limited in-game scenario here, but we're talking about visually identifying the other aircraft that we're fighting before we're allowed to shoot. By the time you got a positive identification, you were inside the lethal head-on envelope of that IR weapon. So a normal uh, tendency for uh, fighter pilots would be to design their tactics uh, so that they didn't get into that lethal environment. However, we had to get into that lethal environment to do the test. We tried to act like we thought we would act in combat, uh, with, the, with the big exception that we wouldn't have gone into most of these fights. Uh, you get killed too often. Your survivability is about uh, three missions. It's nice to go out man to man and say, I beat him flying and get your hands going and work it way at his six, but you might not have a chance to do that if he's carrying an all-aspect threat. You need a standoff capability. Standoff capability is one thing, to be able to launch a missile successfully outside the range of the enemy's weapons. But there's still the requirement in many scenarios for positive visual identification, since there's little advantage in having a long-range missile if you don't know who you're shooting at. We were impacted by the rules of engagement quite a bit in Vietnam. We had to get a positive identification or a PID on every target that we saw, which means we had to get into a close-in environment so they would not have a blue on blue. We certainly did not want to shoot down one of our own aircraft. So there is a case where the PID requirement did not let us employ the missile systems we had on the aircraft, which could go out there 13, 14 miles. It seemed like for all the years that I was in the Navy, ROE requirements almost never changed. Um, technology got better, but you were virtually never guaranteed clearance to fire without a visual ID. With the installation of a television sighting unit, the F-14 has taken the first giant step toward long-range target identification. An electro-optical system, the TVSU helped F-14 crew members positively identify the much smaller F-5 long before being visually detected themselves and at distances significantly greater than the naked eye, often maintaining a lock on the F-5, even through ground clutter and evasive maneuvering. Uh, tell a lot about what the opponent's doing, and that's important to know exactly when he turns into you, for example, if he's running away, and you can't always pick that up just by watching a V sub C on the HUD. You can visually track one target and radar track another target simultaneously. And with a long range VID, sometimes you'll have one radar blip on your scope and you won't know if the, how many there are. You slave the TV, if there's enough contrast there, sometimes you'll pick out two, sometimes as much as four if they're in tight formation trying to mask their IFFs or the number of force mix. Uh, against the F-5s over land, it was very easily, an ID was very easily achieved in the heart of the AIM-7F envelope and it did enable us to uh, achieve sparrow kills and exit the arena prior to being exposed to the F-5 and his AIM-9L. To take full advantage of the TVSU, however, F-14 pilots at Nellis could have used a launch and leave missile if the rules had permitted. Fire and turn away while the weapon continues to the target on its own. Hanging around to see the weapon home got to be very risky. The F-14 with the TVSU would would uh, pick up the F-5, fire a missile at him, and, uh, and it would look as though he had the kill in the bag. But uh, because you had to track the uh, AIM-7 and it was not launch and leave, the two aircraft continued to close until the F-5 could see the F-14. At that stage of the game, he fired a, an AIM-9L that is launch and leave. And uh, even though he's destroyed himself, the, uh, the missile goes on and takes the F-14 with him and you end up with a one-to-one -one kill. TCS came along with the F-14, TVSU to some people, uh, a great system, but limited still 
for a small aircraft like a MiG-21 head-on, um, an F-5 size aircraft, you weren't going to get an ID on him until you were probably inside five miles. We had systems which were not part of the aircraft, our intelligence systems and people who would be in other aircraft listening to what was going on. And I remember in Vietnam, uh, we were often very disappointed to come back after a mission and know that someone had listened to this MiG aircraft that was out there, knew exactly where he is, what he was doing, and uh, we were never past that information. That would have helped us be able to probably identify that aircraft earlier and get an ID on it. In the mid-80s, we saw a big turnaround on information provided to the aircrew. Uh, information that up until that time had been classified, but highly needed by the pilot out there on the tip of the spear, was now being provided to him. So he'd have a better situational awareness of what was out there flying around, what were the intentions of the aircraft flying around, uh, so that if we ever did get into a hostile situation, which we didn't during the period of time I was talking about, uh, we would be able to employ our weapons at the arena they're supposed to be employed at. The first night of Desert Fox, we rolled north into Iraq and, and the ROE was pretty easy because essentially it was, other than some Air Force tanking we had over the water, it was Carrier Air Wing 3 uh, against the Iraqi air defenses and it was, it was a great feeling rolling north with, uh, with the goggles on and again, as far as ROE, knowing that anybody else that was out there coming at us was, was bad. That was, that was a lot of fun. As you can see, we've come a long way since Ace of Al Amaval. In the next and final chapter, we'll hear more from naval aviators and see how Northrop Grumman engineers are working today to give naval aviators the technological edge over current and future threat fighter aircraft. Good kill, Falcon.